What's good everyone, Britt here. So I've played a 10 hours of Diablo 4 and holy crap, I've had a hell of a time. Local co-op was enabled for this build and it wasn't hard to convince my husband to romp around the first zone, Fractured Peaks, with me. We could choose from three classes, Barbarian, Sorcerer, and Rogue. Of course I went Barbarian while he rolled with a Sorcerer. The Necromancer and Druid classes will be available on launch, and based on developer interviews, I'd say it's very likely we'll get more classes added down the road. Character customization included 32 skin tones, face variations, eye, hair color, hairstyle, makeup, and more. But don't expect to be able to modify your body, as according to the team, these predetermined body types are important to keeping that class fantasy alive. And they were right. My female barbarian's arms and thighs, mmm. Standing with my four massive weapons strapped on my back, looking like a goddamn chiseled mountain next to Jason's elegantly robed necromancer, never failed to make me laugh. But things are bad for the people of Sanctuary. This game feels dark. You sense it all around you. You can feel the hatred and distrust from those still managing to scrape by. To be clear, this doesn't make Diablo 4 a depressing game to play. It's just that Diablo 4 really does feel like it's returning to darkness, and I am here for it. You can sense that darkness while you're traversing the open world. Every asset leans into this, and god it just works so well. Speaking of, we got up to a lot of shenanigans in Sanctuary. We liberated strongholds, solved a dozen side quests, tackled some tough side dungeons, and cleared out countless cellars. The cellars are these quick 60-90 to 90 second room clearing romps, while the strongholds took much longer and often required multiple steps. But once you clear one of those bad boys, it becomes a friendly settlement, sometimes with new quests and more, so definitely worth your while. From the map, there's a handy dandy regional objective menu you can reference that shows just how much of that side content you've tackled and just how much more you have yet to find. Finding and completing the side stuff, along with others I didn't mention, grants renown. Once you've collected enough renown, you'll continue to unlock bonus XP and skill points to every character on your account. A potential concern is that some of this content could start to feel samey, especially the dungeons. But during an interview, we were told the team has made great efforts to ensure each dungeon has a personality of its own with varying objectives. So we'll see. But you're not going to get far in those dungeons if your character isn't beefy enough, and boy oh boy, where do I even begin with the progression? The skill tree is large, and honestly, it felt a little overwhelming at first. But that's what we want, right? A feeling of agency, like this character truly is our handcrafted hero. But once you dig into it, it makes more sense. So each skill tree has two additional upgrades you can choose from, but you can only have one of the two active at a time. The Diablo team was frank with us. The point of the skill tree is to introduce players to their characters, to sell them on their class fantasy, and get them through the campaign, which by the way should take 35 to 50 hours or so. At least that's what they claimed was the average playtime. All I can say is I spent 11 to 12 hours in the first area, Fractured Peaks, and I hadn't even begun to really make a dent in all the content. So I think my playtime in particular will be a lot longer. But after you've sort of mastered the skill tree an inch closer to that end game, you'll run into legendaries, which supposedly, and I quote, break all the rules. And then you have the Paragon board, which is a stat level system that allows you to customize your character even further. And on top of that, there is the Codex of Power, which allows you to earn legendary powers you can imprint on your weapons after completing side dungeons. Whew. And don't worry, you'll be able to respect that tree. It does cost gold, but it's cheap towards the beginning of your build, so feel free to experiment. As you progress, though, it will get spendy, a little complicated, and maybe, just maybe, you'll want to roll a new character. But, if you've completed the campaign on your account, you'll be able to skip the campaign with any new character you create on that account and move right into endgame goodness. One of the biggest changes has to be that evade button. And yeah, if you didn't know, you can now evade. I honestly really like this, and the reason the team gave for giving us a dedicated button to evade made sense. Essentially, with all the different ways we can build our characters, the team wanted to ensure there was always a way a player could stand a sliver of a chance, my word's not theirs, regardless of their build. What if you build a sorceress but don't have teleport? Are you just destined to take every attack to the face? Some might say, get good, create a better build, but like I said earlier, I like this decision, and hey, there's a cooldown for evading, so you can't mash it. And by no means is this a broken mechanic, you will still get smacked around plenty. As I mentioned earlier, I played this build cooperatively, locally, and while I ultimately plan on playing this via online co-op come release, I was happy with the way local co-op works, and you know honestly, I wouldn't be opposed to doing a few runs this way. 
So here are some of the things you should know about the local co-op functionality. Gold and loot are automatically assigned to player 1 or player 2. That said, either player can pick up the loot and it'll automatically go to the intended player's inventory. Opening up your inventory menu will block your side of the screen, but on the other half, the map will recenter so your partner can continue running around or talking to other people. Both players can talk to the same merchant at the same time and go about their business buying, selling, crafting, etc. There is a tethering system, but it wasn't awful. If you run too far away from your partner, the map will zoom out as much as it can before it teleports them to you. And I noticed some of the in-game dialogue scenes tried to accommodate both players by keeping the map zoomed out as much as possible. Although I will say this did cause a funky centering and was distracting during pivotal conversations. While there are many games I'm looking forward to next year, I gotta say Diablo 4 is inching closer and closer to the very top of that list. This was an early build, not everything was working properly, but even in the state it was in, I couldn't wait to get my hands on it every night during our access period. It's wild to me that, again, a game this early could be one of the best co-op experiences I've had in a long time. But that's just Diablo for you. There's nothing like it. The darker tone, the customization options. I need this game out, like, now so I can experience it in its full finished glory. We recently got a release date of June 6th, 2023 at the Game Awards, so hopefully the time between now and then will go incredibly fast.